Hey there, Internet. I'm Funky Monkey. Welcome to my house of lard. You know, what with all the craziness over the past couple of years, I can't help but wonder how many of us right now are living in our own heads. Even your humble host has felt this way, like I've been trapped inside a wall of isolation. Which brings me to today's subject, Pink Floyd's legendary concept double album, The Wall. Released in 1979, The Wall is a semi-autobiographical tale of Pink, a depressed rock star who over the course of the four LP sides, or two CDs, slides into psychosis. Not the most uplifting of topics, certainly, but the album sold a million copies in its first two months, and even spawned a movie. But that's a whole other review in itself, and there's a lot to unpack before we even get to this album. So let's start with the band themselves, Pink Floyd. The main members of the group are Roger Waters, David Gilmour, Nick Mason, Richard Wright, and last but by no means least, Sid Barrett. After several nebulous incarnations featuring fellow students, which is what the band were at the time, the band that would come to be known as Pink Floyd, after blues musicians Pink Anderson and Floyd Council, finally crystallised in 1965, with Gilmore joining in 1967. More on that later. At this time, the band were performing under the name The Tea Set. However, as the story goes, there was another band with this name performing one night, so Sid came up with a new moniker in a flash of inspiration based on two blues musicians he had in his record collection. And so this bluesy foursome joined the London musical underground of the swinging 60s, pairing lengthy noodlings with rudimentary, yet still impressive for the time, light shows. In fact, this chapter's title is drawn from the lyrics of one of their songs written in this period, Astronomy Domine. Another of their songs, Arnold Lane, became their first single. However, being as it was the tale of a transvestite, as they were known at the time, it understandably failed to set the charts alight. Their next song, See Emily Play, fared better, reaching the heady heights of number six in the UK chart in 1967. The future seemed bright for this ragtag bunch of polytechnic popsters, but fate had other plans. Sid Barrett, or to give him his birth name, Roger Keith Barrett, who was born in January 1946. He'd revert to that name later in life, but we'll get to that. Sid joined the T-Set in 1965, and as stated, came up with the new name on the night that another T-Set band shared the bill. But it was also around this time that Sid started experimenting with psychedelic drugs. Which is definitely not something that you should try at home unless you have specialist medical help on hand, in case you have a bad trip. The LSD usage may have heightened latent mental health issues that were already there, or caused them outright. We don't know. What we do know is that they affected his ability to perform with Pink Floyd, which was a problem for a band that was touring. In response to this, the band hired David Gilmour, initially as a fifth member, but it quickly became apparent that an increasingly unpredictable Sid would need to be permanently replaced. And so, it was made official in April of 1968. Barrett resurfaced as a solo artist in late 1969 with the single Octopus, followed in 1970 with the album The Mad Cap Laughs. By the end of 1970, he released another album, simply titled Barrett. Barrett's contract with EMI ended in 1972, and he mostly retired from music by 1974, disappearing entirely from the public eye by 1978. And so, Roger Keith Barrett lived a quiet life in Cambridge, far from the madding crowd of the music industry, filling his time with painting and gardening, until his death from pancreatic cancer in 2006. Back on Planet Floyd, the once more foursome recorded several albums over the course of the 1970s, 
some of the most notable of which include Umaguma, famous for the spectacularly titled Several Species of Small Furry Animals Gathered Together in a Cave and Grooving with a Pict, Atom Heart Mother, the title track being a 20 plus minute suite featuring a full brass ensemble, and The Legendary Dark Side of the Moon, which is said to synchronise with the 1939 film The Wizard of Oz. Hmm. Citation needed on that one, methinks. But as the decade progressed, malaise over the fate of Barrett, burnout, especially in the wake of Dark Side of the Moon, and outside influences in the home and family lives of the band members gave Roger Waters the space to take lead of the band, and their tenth album, Animals, was a concept album on the state of society in mid-1970s Britain. And without wishing to go into specifics... British society in the mid-1970s was in a right old state. <laughs> Plus a change, as the French say. This album formed the basis for the In The Flesh tour, the band's first experience with stadium venues. And to put it mildly, it was not a good experience. Pink Floyd were never the kind of turn-it-up-and-rip-off-the-knob metal band that were best served by stadium tours, and Roger Waters in particular was agitated by the boisterous nature of some fans passing around beach balls, letting off fireworks, screaming out during the quieter moments. All of which would come to a head on the 6th of July in 1977. A small group of rambunctious patrons in the front row had provoked Water's ire, to the point where he spat at one of them. It was this moment of frustration and disconnection between artist and audience that would lead to the band's next album. In 1978, things were looking grim for Pink Floyd. Musically, they were just as strong as they'd always been, but a bad financial investment spiralled into a potential tax bombshell. The band needed money, and fast. Enter Waters with two ideas. Firstly, a 90-minute demo that he called Bricks in the Wall, and secondly, a story about a man's dreams over the course of one night. While the latter would become his later solo album, The Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking, it's the former that we're more interested in. Bringing in collaborator Bob Ezrin, the concept was refined from a purely autobiographical story centred around Waters as a character, to one more featuring elements of the band as a composite, becoming the character of Pink. However, it wasn't all smooth sailing. Over the course of recording, keyboardist Richard Wright was felt to be not contributing his fair share of ideas and material which put further pressure on already strained relationships, as the band hadn't been on good terms for years now. And so, either having been pushed, or having jumped on his own, Richard Wright parted ways with Pink Floyd after The Wall. The Wall was released in the US and UK on November 30th of 1979, and for the next 15 weeks, it reigned supreme at the top of the American Billboard magazine album chart. From the back of this, the band issued their first single for many years, Another Brick in the Wall Part 2, which also topped the charts in the US and UK. Waters would stay with Pink Floyd for one more album before an acrimonious split, which doesn't need detailing here. Gilmore and the other remaining founding member Nick Mason reunited with Wright, for another two albums between 1985 and 1994. More recently, Gilmore and Mason also recorded Hey Hey Rise Up under the name of Pink Floyd in 2022 as a charity single to aid the relief efforts for the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Richard Wright was not involved in this, owing to his death from lung cancer in 2008. Waters would go on to have a long and storied solo career, performing The Wall with other collaborators in Berlin in 1990, and with a new backing band between 2010 and 2013. And if you think that this was long, you should see what I've left out. But anyway, let's stop beating about the bush and get to the album itself. The story, in short, is that of Pink, notionally the lead singer of a band, who lost his father in World War II and at a young age, which is the first brick in a psychological wall. A concept which puts me in mind of the AT fields in Evangelion. And as we follow Pink from school, to his first band, to hitting the big time, to stardom,
to disillusionment somewhere in a hotel strung out and burned out one night it all proves too much and pink's wall is completed leaving him trapped inside his own mind but the show must go on and when he's revived with a miracle cure he hallucinates himself as a fascist demagogue until the drugs wear off and his conscience puts him on trial ordering the wall torn down all of which at last brings us to the point of this video my opinion and i feel like i really shouldn't put this into the house of love for being a psychological horror but i'm going to if only for its status it's not an easy listen obviously this tale of the harsh realities of 1940s 1950s childhood the psychological toll of touring and how we can ultimately still relate to each other puts me in mind somewhat of the plight of Evangelion protagonist Shinji Ikari, although the main difference is that they never had to pump Shinji with drugs to get him in the Ava. So let's get to the actual performance, and seeing as Waters is the main singing performance on the album, his delivery ranges from powerful to unsettling to suitably strained as you can imagine him struggling to keep it together in Don't Leave Me Now to the impressive range of accents on display as he portrays the many characters of Pink's psyche in The Trial. So what of the songs themselves? Well, they're rather bluesy noodles for the most part. Excepting the plot heavier moments like Another Brick in the Wall, all three parts of which resonate with a 4-4 beat that was meant to be disco, but can easily be read as marching feet. And does it actually tell a story? Yes thanks to the production and sound effects between songs adding much needed context to flesh out the actual story, which was strong enough to warrant an actual film adaptation three years later. So what brings me back to it? Honestly, the ending. The fact that, after all the suffering, after them putting a clearly mentally unwell man on a stage, hallucinating as he goes, that he is disgusted with himself afterward and resolves to be better. So. How can I judge whether a concept double album like this is good or bad? Well, I like it. The musicianship is smooth and professional, the concept is fascinating, and for reasons that I can't fully explain, I feel some kind of kinship with Pink. Overall, the music style might not be to your taste, and the explicit themes of Act 4 or Side 4 remain controversial to this day. But I happen to think that there is plenty to celebrate in this rock opera. So thanks for watching. If you liked this video, you know where that button is. And why not consider subscribing and ringing the notification bell? And if you want to tear down the wall between us, sign up for my crowdfunding links in the description below. And join me next week when we dive into the movie adaptation. But for now, I've been Funky Monkey, wishing you good days, good mental health, and great entertainment. So long, folks.